How's it going, guys? Just before we start today's episode, I just want to say a massive thank you for being here, for tuning in and having a listen, having a watch to the show. Truly makes a massive difference. And I just know you're going to come away from here with something just really good from this episode. However, I just want to say quickly that over the last couple of years doing this podcast, we have gone from zero to a hundred in this podcast with just the quality the editing the guest range and that's been made possible by the amazing subscriber base who have just hit that subscribe button and just supported me on this journey and i'm going to ask you if you could do the same today if you enjoy this episode please make sure to hit that subscribe button or follow if you're on audio only It truly makes more of a difference than you could ever imagine. And honestly, just every subscriber that goes into that number, it just contributes more to getting better and better guests on the show. So if you could just hit that subscribe button, or if you've already done that, maybe give it a share around or leave a rating and a review. It truly makes a massive difference to getting the show to the, uh, the true vision I have for it. So guys, without further ado, let's get over to the episode and enjoy. Cheers. How's it going, guys? Welcome to episode 113 of Talk for the Quickfire podcast, where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. That's me. And let me introduce our special guest for today. William Markham is going to be answering our questions today. So, Will, how are you doing today? And welcome to the Talk for podcast. This is going to be awesome. Oh, Louis, I'm doing outstanding today. I truly appreciate you having me on and uh, look forward to the time together. Thank you. It's going to be brilliant. I've been I've been so looking forward to this. And I, I've always found in the past that the people with experience like yours and careers like yours, it just leads to the best kinds of conversation and is the most interesting to listen to. So absolutely thrilled to have you here in kind of a 30 to 60 second window, if you will, kind of the elevator pitch, if you will. Just a bit about who you are, really, what your day job is, and just a kind of a little picture into the life of you. And then we're going to dig into it further right after that. Well, I was really fortunate. I got to serve uh, 30 years in the United States Air Force. Um, Man, it was it was just such an honor to serve. And uh, I got to raise to the rank of uh, command chief, um, mass sergeant, Uh, got to serve uh, as an overseas um, uh, SEL senior enlisted leader and just work with such phenomenal people. Uh, my, my air force career started out as a, as a cop and a little bit of a bumpy one. Um, wasn't the, wasn't the best airman coming up the ranks. And then, uh, I got the opportunity to cross train into combat control and spend about 25 years in special operations. And so that was the, that was probably the best part of my career, but um, I would say truly the the best part was uh, serving others as a, as a command chief and uh, being able to make a difference in people's lives. And that's brilliant. And just for a bit of insight to the people listening to who obviously don't know how we got connected, but uh, Will here was connection off the back of my podcast with uh, the SEAC, uh, CZ, who obviously you know incredible person just the accolades and the commemorations that person has are just beyond belief and to quote him in his email to me he said that will here is one of the or the baddest warriors that he knows so what do you have to say to that (laughs) yeah that's a that's a that's a tall order because cz has gotten to work with the um the best of the best i mean he's he truly has, um, you know, been attached to to the best teams in the world. He's gotten to lead with the best people in the world. And um, for him to say something like that, I'm truly honored and humbled. But um, I, I don't take that. To, um, I was fortunate to, again, serve with some of the some of the best teams in the world and uh, some of the best people in the world who I still have contact with today. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it holds true that. You know, surround yourself with five, you know, really good people, five important people, you know, five successful people, um, and you become the six. And so I'm still working on becoming the six in all those aspects. But I, I think truly hanging out with uh, with good people, um, you find yourselves in unique uh, opportunities to, to serve others. No doubt about it. I could not agree more with that. Um let's take a look into the backstory then so this is where we like to start on the show 
I just kind of want to get the picture really of of where you come from, how all this came about and that career path kind of leading into the military. So, you know, where'd you grow up? How did the military come about for you? And just kind of what were some of those initial drives towards joining the military, would you say, then um, and getting in? Well, we were just joking about this. I was up in Wisconsin for about 10 days for our, our big uh, charity golf event that we have up there and little uh, appreciation dinner and um, talking to people up there. They, you know, uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin is where I was born and raised, uh, not a military town by any means, uh, not even military near there. We have the Milwaukee Reserve, you know, air unit, air guard unit in out of Milwaukee. Um, knew nothing about that. Uh, Fort McCoy up north, um, you know, there's some Air National Guard uh, training up there, but just never, you know, the military was just never a, a product by design while I was growing up. Um, a very industrial uh, type area, you know, Waukesha Engine, Briggs and Stratton, Generac. Um, I went to a co-op high school, so I was studying to be a mechanic, uh, diesel mechanic. Um, and then I just, I, I just had that feeling like, man, I, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be a, my, my two best friends are the first and second best pool players in my hometown. I didn't want to be the third. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't want to be the third best at anything. And um, I just knew it was time for me to get out of town and, and the air force, I know this sounds horrible, but the air force was the closest thing to being a civilian um, at the time that what I was looking at doing um you know, I just wanted to go in, get a few years, uh, get some money for college. And, um, you know, the, the the closest thing to, like I said, being a civilian was, you know, for me joining the Air Force. The, the Marines and Army and the Navy all looked very wonderful. But at the time, it was just a, that was just a little, you know, little boy from Waukesha, Wisconsin. That was just a little, little too far of a step until I joined the military. And then and then. Uh, things started going, going that way, but yep. Grew up in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Didn't want to work in the foundry. Didn't want to, you know, didn't want to bartend the rest of my life. Plenty of great people came out of Waukesha, Wisconsin, and they're doing wonderful things. I just was not going to be that, that kid graduating at the bottom of my high school class and not knowing what to do. So military was the best thing. There we go. And clearly it was a, a good decision made. So Obviously, quite a diverse audience that we have on this show. Not all of the people here are going to be very military oriented or have you know, the best amount of clue about all the ranks and how all that works and stuff. So I think going forward from where we're at now in that timeline, could you kind of guide us through a bit of that career, what you did and kind of in a nutshell and then getting out to your uh, your roles as the command chief master sergeant and just like a bit about kind of what that role really was what the initiatives you led there were and um and how, how high up the rank was it well like i said i i, I joined the air force uh, originally was going to become a inventory specialist you know right out of basic training um you know work in supply but uh i had taking an interest in law enforcement work, um, you know, in my high school uh, years and did the, uh, did the ride along with the local uh, police department. I was a explorer cadet in earlier years, uh, ma mainly because I got in trouble. And uh, uh, one of the police captains, Gordy Nell, uh, in the town I was growing up at the time, you know, took me under his wing and said, you can either, you can either be in jail or you can help us, you know, keep people, like you out of jail and, wow. you know, just be a good mentor. Um, and, and that's truly what it was. It was just having good mentorship, you know, uh, growing up, um, joined the air force the day after high school on my 18th birthday in 1986, uh, June 9th. And, um, just never looked back. Um, got into, got into law enforcement right away. I uh, just thought it was thought it was a great job. Um, got stationed in Sacramento, California. I met my first wife out there. Uh, we had our uh, we got married. We had our we had our daughter Shauna, and uh, at that time I was just uh, you know one year year and a half in the the military where I was starting to see a lot of really neat things. Um, pararescue, what CZ did, that always interested me. But I found out I I had a very bad medical stigma. I didn't like to. I didn't like to see blood or that type of training in training, real life, no big deal. But 
Um, in order to become an expert at it, you got to train at it. And I just wasn't able to get over that hump of getting over that, that medical thing just always made me queasy, sick to my stomach. Uh, got introduced to what combat controllers did, um, basically glorified air traffic controllers, um, that can, you know, jump in, survey an airfield, uh, landing zone, um, you know, uh, bring in aircraft, uh, for resupply and then also do any type of close air support. So that really, uh, interested me, uh, again, you know, the one air force guy attached to a Navy SEAL team an army special forces team, or, you know, you name the government agency or the foreign soft team, uh, you know, British SAS, you know, you, you name it that we're that we're that air to ground entity, uh, attached to one of those teams, and it's usually by yourself. So, um, you have to, you have to really roll with what that, what that team is doing, um, and how they've trained. And so you got to become, a, a, an expert at what they do, um, uh, very proficient at it, but then also be an expert at what you do in the, the air to ground interface. So, like I said, I had a little bit of a rough start. I wasn't that great of a, I was probably maybe too motivated, um, got in a little bit of trouble as a cop, uh, stepped on my crank a few times. Um, I think that truly made me appreciate the air force and what, uh, becoming a, a very young veteran could have meant. Um, and so I, I really appreciated the Air Force. I appreciate the people that that stuck up for me um, to this day. You know, uh, uh, an individual that you need to, you're probably your next interview, Mike Trot, former cop, former supervisor of mine, um, got into, I think, the Secret Service, uh, but then finished his career in the CIA. And now he he's a part owner of Four Branches Bourbon. So he, you can kind of see the trend of people that, you know, you get associated with, you know, they're not just one and done. They're just not, you know, they're not just a match, you know, flame, you know, a quick flame and then they flame out it. These people that have, that have mentored me and have moved around um, have not only been successful in their primary career, but then in their follow on careers, they've been very successful. So that's the type of people you want to hang out with. But um, got into combat control um, at 24 years old and uh, never looked back. Unfortunately, it cost me my uh, first family. Um, I, I didn't get to, you know, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with my daughter uh, being divorced uh, from my first wife. Um, so that kind of made me the almost the perfect combat controller. I didn't have a lot of ties at home and I could be on the road all the time. Uh, the job is demanding. It, it takes a lot out of you. It takes a lot of your time. Um, there's so many aspects of it. There's no way you can become an expert in any, you know, all of the all of the disciplines and um, principles of it. So you just kind of kind of focus on one thing. Um, obviously, in the, the mid 90s, you know, not a whole lot going on. Uh, we had thought we had missed the war of uh, the Gulf War, you know, Grenada, uh, Panama had gone by. And uh, now we were just kind of, you know, sitting in these overwatch positions, making sure the Iraqis really didn't do anything too crazy. 9-11 um, kicked off, which was at the prime time in my career, 15 years in, just about um, assistant team sergeant, uh, working for a great team sergeant, Bart Decker, uh, one of the best one of the best NCOs our, our career field has, and senior NCOs our career field has ever ever has ever offered um uh <laughs> we uh nah, you know louis i don't know how how old you were but when 9 11 kicked off but man like to this day you know 20 some years later i still remember the day very vividly and where i was what i was doing what the team was doing we were getting ready for a monster mash a you know extreme physical conditioning exercise that morning and uh man we you know went into the team rooms we saw the uh, we saw the second plane hit the the second tower yeah. and then we knew it was game on um uh, we had a great leadership um uh kurt bowler patrick piana um uh our senior um uh elliot uh just just amazing people to to lead us bart decker uh, billy white um, just some amazing people to lead us downrange and uh, get us into the fight. But um, that kicked it off. We went over to Uzbekistan and um, 
got the runways open there. Um, what we do as combat controllers set up a, an airhead. Um, we later had relief come in and take that over. And then we started the search and rescue combat search and rescue set up there in Uzbekistan. And then a little thing kicked off called unconventional warfare, where they wanted to send in small teams attached to the Northern Alliance, along with our the agency counterparts. And I got the great opportunity to be part of that. And I was attached to um, ODA operational attachment alpha team out of Fifth special forces group ODA 555 in which I got to work with uh, amazing individuals got to work with Greg McCormick my swim buddy from uh, combat diver school back from you know 90 what was it 92 93 you know so soft special operations is a very small community you'll end up training and working with the you know same people that you went to schools with that you trained with you you blood and you sweat with, you know, um, and it just kind of came full circle. I ended up um, being a, having the uh, the SF medic, uh, Scott um, Zastro, who was kind of from my hometown, from Wisconsin. Um, uh, and to this day, we still work together with Project Dovat, but right. just got attached to a wonderful team. Um, not a whole lot of rules of engagement at the time, just kill the enemy. Um, and so that's what we did, being the first team, Tiger 01, to go into Afghanistan in uh, October of 2001 um, in the uh, Panzer Valley and then pushed down to the Bagram area um, right before the big uh, CZ's big jump into um, uh, uh, into Rhino, uh, the big airborne operation that kicked JSOC off on the 19th. Uh, we were just in country just prior to them. Uh, in the north, uh, starting to uh, take care of business up there. But um, again, Louis, it's just being around good people. It's uh, it's maybe not always being on the right operation or, you know, lugging the rucksack to this country or that country. But it's just it's always taking care of other people before you take care of yourself um, uh, with the war kicking off and a lot of things happening. Um, a lot of great people, a lot of good leaders um, had decided to get out and uh, take a, you know, uh, a civilian role or do some contract work um, that just kind of, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> yeah, left some of the ranks open. Uh, whereas I, if if a lot of those good people um, wouldn't have gotten out, I would have just probably been satisfied and retired as a master sergeant at 20 years and went off and did some contracting work and not made a whole lot of big difference in people's lives. But I knew there was a bigger call and I pushed for um, making rank. I had great leaders like Vinny Venturella, um, Sean Gleffy, um, Mike LaMonica, uh, just some uber fantastic senior NCOs uh, that said, if you really want to make a difference, become a chief. And so that was the goal was to become a chief master sergeant in E9 and then make some difference in people's lives. And then from being a chief master sergeant in the Air Force and then the, the US DOD ranks, you, you uh, rise up to being a command senior enlisted leader. Um, in the Air Force, we have the top 1% is uh, E9s. So about 3,000 E9s of the 300,000 force that we have. And then of that, um, about top, you know, one to 1 1.5% become uh, command senior enlisted leaders. And that's just where it's a nominated position. You're you're selected by your command or by the, the hiring authority to go and work for that individual. But then you're, you're working at the 06 to, you know, general officer level. And that was just great because you see a problem, um, you see a problem that somebody's facing, uh, either with their family, with their career, you know, whatever it is. And you're the person that, you know, kind of ties all the knots, you know, unties all the knots and gets this person, you know, where they need to be, when they need to be and how they need to be. And that's truly the, the most job satisfaction I've ever had in my entire career was getting somebody where they need to be. Um, because their family was there or getting, you know, somebody, something in the military or something from the Department of Defense, because um, it was due to them, they were owed it, they've earned it, they deserved it, whether that be, you know, rank and award, you know, you name it, 
a PCS to a home station, PCS closer to their parents so they can take care of them. Man, just, Louis, just helping other people achieve their goals, there's no better, there's no better satisfaction in the world. What's up, guys? Just taking a quick break here just to hear from our sponsor, Shopify, for today's episode. Guys, honestly, starting this podcast and stuff, making my own personal website, even my business website, too, it just seemed like a, such a far away dream for me, honestly. And I just had no idea how to even go about it. And I thought I needed to code. I thought I needed all these skills and degrees and stuff to start my business. But that has been completely proven wrong by Shopify. Shopify is the e-commerce platform that runs everything that I'm doing just about. And they are the all-in-one platform for running websites. They have their own app store, dude. They have their own app store for websites. So you can have everything from the countdown timers to the subscriptions to conversion upsells to blog posts, pages, and it's all just managed in this one website or app, even they've got apps on smartphones. It's just amazing. And as a promotional offer for the Talk4 podcast, we can get you started on Shopify for just, wait for it, for just one pound, just one pound to start your business online and get it growing in absolutely the best platform there is for running an online business nowadays. So guys, head to the link in bio and uh, yeah, we've got a code there and uh, get started. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> No, I couldn't agree more. Thank you for the clarity there. That's, it's so impressive. And I think what I've kind of noted down for the show going forward from here is I want to talk a bit about Afghanistan, but I feel like I'd be remise not to at least just ask the question that's in my head right now. So obviously, you know, it's no shallow compliment for someone like CZ to to have complimented you in that way and say you're one of the baddest warriors that he's ever known in that kind of a career. And what you're saying there about the people that you were working with and how they transitioned out and became successful and weren't just the flash in the pan in the military. I'd love to know what you think were some of those traits or some of those reasons why you think those people were so successful outside the military as well as inside the military. So what were they kind of transitioning out with in terms of personality traits, habits, work ethic? What was it do you think that made them successful not once but twice or more than that and in your in your experience too for yourself because obviously CZ said those things about you too so what do you think it is that made those people and yourself successful outside as well I, I I think it's because I think outside the box they they weren't limited to you know where you know they were limited by their imagination and they were very smart people I've had enlisted people that I worked with and I said you're and I, and I don't mean this as an insult to any enlisted person or the enlisted rank structure, but they were just too intelligent to stay an enlisted person. Their, hmm. their, where they were going to make a difference was by becoming an officer. And so uh, I had some of my um, uh, subordinates, you know, I really pushed towards being an officer. And then some just were, they were just so dynamically intelligent, you know, thinking on the the realms of UAVs and, you know, drones and electronic warfare. You know, we had we had individuals that they had reached their they had reached their limit in the military. They you know, they're not going to they're, they're not going to achieve in a rank, a rank where they're going to be able to make that big of a difference. Um, but they had the, the intelligence to get out of the military, work for a corporation that could explore all those things, um, produce those products. And, you know, uh, later down, later down the road, we would be able to use those products in both humanitarian missions and in kinetic, you know, warfare. And so I think the, the main trait is just, you know, they were, they were smart enough to think outside the box and they didn't, the, 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 the military is, you see a lot of this. You see a lot of people in the military, they're retired on active duty. They're just collecting a paycheck and fucking good on them. You know, if that's what it, you know, that's what it takes for them to survive, then good. But there's a lot of people in the military. They don't need the military. They don't need it. They, they, they would perform and do so well 
outside of the military that, you know, our, you know, our, our team sergeants, our supervisors and stuff almost kind of treat them bad when they get out because it's like, man, I know you're going to go on to do such great things, but I'm being selfish because I want you in because you're such a leader and you're such a performer that we want them to stay in the military. But we know, we know in the back of our head, you are just going to go and just destroy it out there and do some incredible things. And so it's kind of a, it's kind of a love hate relationship with them, but those people just, they have the ability to think outside the box and they're not dependent on the military for their way of life. They, they can get out, go to school, become productive, get great jobs and support their families. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for the clarity there. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about I want to talk about Afghanistan. So one of the things that was mentioned to me about you initially was that one of you were one of the first boots on the ground out there. I think that's so unique and I'm just so interested to know a little bit about what that was like really. Just kind of if you can tell it in a story way, almost as if we're in your boots in that situation, you know, what's going through your head? Just tell us the story of the, you know the flight over there the first tasks and order of GC that was conducted there. And just, I feel like it would be a really interesting to listen to see what it was like from your perspective in that situation. It was, it was crazy. It was very surreal. And, and, you know, I relive this thought many times in my head. It's a, uh, I joke, it's almost my, I, I would have swore my leadership was trying to get rid of me. Um, you know, we're doing something that hadn't been done before. It's unconventional warfare. It's, you know, that the, the special forces teams have had trained in it and had kind of done it a little bit um, in real world, but never in mass kinetic, you know, operations against the enemy. And so um, getting paired up with the, you know, thinking you're going to do you know, set up an airfield and run airfield operations and then move it into for just a few days, combat search and rescue where, you know, combat controller and two PJs are assigned to a, a, a helicopter, you know, some type of rotary t team, you know, task force 160th and our helicopters were inbound. Obviously, we we're going to have the northern side of Afghanistan in case any, you know, pilots, you know, went down, we would go and provide combat search and rescue to where, okay, no, we're not even going to do that. We're going to, they're going to self-support. They're going to, with their crews, they're going to self-support and do combat search and rescue. And then we're going to provide unconventional warfare. And the combat controller then goes to the team and provides that air to ground interface. You got to remember, Louis, close air support really hadn't been done since Vietnam. We trained a we trained a fucking ton on it. Um, in fact, we had you know not such great commanders and senior enlisted leaders within our ranks go, oh, we'll never we'll never do that. There's no reason to be you know fifty percent or thirty percent or twenty percent qualified and certified within our within our units. We're, we'll that that fight will never happen. And man, it fucking did. You know, and close air support like. It's not very sexy because you're, you know, you're just the teams on the ground at one position talking to an aircraft or aircrafts, you know, many aircraft uh, trying to get them to drop a world of hate on the enemy, you know, sometimes danger close within a couple hundred meters of your position. Was it A-10s? Sometimes, you know. Um, well, we didn't get to start out with A-10s. We started out with fast movers, you know, coming in um, off of a carrier group. So we had F-16s, F-15s coming in, and then eventually we had bombers. We, unfortunately, um, the main effort where we had up in Bagram, um, the AC-130s were mainly doing JSOC operations in the south, and then the A-10s were, were doing operations in the south. Up in the north, um, when we went in, it was – you know, crews were flying hours upon hours upon hours to get to us, staying as long as they could, or at least until they got rid of all of their, you know, guns and ammo or guns and bombs, uh, and then hitting a tanker and going back home or, you know, hitting multiple tankers, you know, so it was a, it was a huge team effort to get aircraft to where we were. Um, it was no small feat. I, Talk to crews that had spent hours and hours and hours in the air just to get to us 
And so my job as a combat controller then was to provide them the best, you know, site picture, the best target rich environment on, you know, for them on the ground and be able to speak that clean and concisely, the right phraseology, the right terminology, you know, to the point where it had to be done right the first time, every time, or we could, the aircraft would have to leave station and go hit a tanker somewhere. Um, we also got ourselves, because we were the first team on the ground, we got ourselves put into situations, um, I don't want to say self-induced, but uh, our counterpart, our Northern Alliance counterpart, saw the type of, you know, close air support that we could do once we did it. Um, and then we're just like, all right, full bull, we're going to the front, you know, we're going to the front line. This, <laughs> you know, they just thought it was FM fucking magic, you know, shit. You know, I we pointed at something and it blew up. They didn't realize all the logistics and everything, you know, the hundreds of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people all behind that, you know, making sure those aircraft got to us for that lonely maintenance guy making sure the aircraft was good to launch you know and you know it took more than just pilots and crew and gas and maintenance it took a lot of people behind us to to make sure we had the um you know the the right aircraft overhead and, and putting the the right bombs on target and then you know doing cast close air support for 24 hours a day seven days a week for the first 25 days you know, the first couple, first week, we were the only team in town. So we had all the casts. And then that kind of became the norm of putting small special operations teams in Afghanistan and, and then all the teams doing doing really well and, you know, defeating their their enemy that was in front of them. So it was surreal. It, was, it, was, it, it wasn't like a super high tech war, but it was because we were doing close air support. But um, I relied on the special forces team that I was with, uh, you know, to stay alive. And, you know, we depended on each other, you know, that's why special operations, I, I believe is so great. Um, you know, it's a band of brothers coming together and making shit happen. How much of an effect do you think you had out there in, in the grand scheme of things and just in your time there? So how much of an effect do you think you had out there with the work that you were doing and when did you when did you get out uh, out of afghanistan then well if you i mean if you look at it now it had no effect <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know we 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 ended you know i'm i'm being i'm not i'm i mean i can be cynical of myself but we had absolutely no effect we knew it would happen you know that country was never ever going to change um they never wanted us in there by mass, you know, General Fahim Khan and General uh, Sharif, the the two leading Northern Alliance generals our team was with was like, please don't have a bunch of Americans come in. Please don't, you know, please don't. But, you know, nobody listens. And uh, man, once once we liberated Kabul and we're able to open up Bagram and um my fellow combat controllers that followed in after me and once we opened up Bagram and opened up that artery, I mean, it was over with, you know, like that country was never going to be the same. It was never just going to be small pockets of special operations forces helping the Northern Alliance defeat the Taliban and, and keep kind of like an even cue because one thing we're always, you know, since, since the day of America, we're always trying to make people like us instead of just better than their enemy. And so that's kind of where we, that's kind of where we, we lost it. But um, we were very effective on the ground. In fact, that, you know, the experts, you know, gave us six months to do what we did and we did it in 25 days. Wow. Uh, we had the right leadership. We had the right engagement. We took out the right pockets of enemies so that the Northern Alliance could go and turn Kabul. And on 13 November, when, uh, when we, when we, took all of Bagram and then moved into Kabul, that changed the war, you know, and unfortunately the, the crew Rocky six, one, a B 52 crew will never be probably never be recognized in my lifetime for this because um, people, you know, leadership has got better things to do, but Rocky six, one led by, you know, the radar nav Scotty Briscoe changed the tide of the war. I mean, we were, we were up against a, uh, 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 
a force that was going to overtake us. Uh, and if they would have had overtaken us, they would have annihilated the Northern Alliance going all the way up to the Panzer Valley. That would have probably changed the 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 tune for the Taliban and the Northern Alliance throughout all of Afghanistan, all of our efforts in Mazar Sharif and in Kandahar would have probably been, you know, taken over. Um, but that that one sole B-52 crew, Rocky 6-1, uh laid down a world of hate on November 13th and you know, annihilated about 3,500 Taliban that day and broke their will to fight. And the Northern Alliance were able to take Kabul the next day. Uh, that was the turning point of the war. That one mission right there was the turning point. All the other, all the other facets fell, and the teams were able to take Mazar Sharif, Kandahar, uh, Jabad, you know, and and that that turned the tide of the war. So yeah, we did have a huge effect. Um, as a team with all the teams out there, it wouldn't have been done unless all the teams would have been there, but then we fucked it all up. How and I can say that <laughs> we tried to make, we tried to make the Afghans like us, you know, we spent a lot of money. We lost a lot of lives. We tried to make the, we tried to make Afghanistan just like us. And the Taliban just sat, sat back and waited and like, yeah, we'll just sit back and wait. We'll just sit back and wait. And at one point, your country won't have the stomach for this anymore. And um, I was there as a command senior enlisted leader from 2014 to 2015, and we had 9,000 troops in Afghanistan, and we were holding up just fine. We could have we could have continued to do that with small pockets of special operations, you know, keeping the Taliban and ISIS forces back. But we decided to pull out full as a country. And in my opinion, that was the biggest mistake. Whereabouts were you? And it's when no the draw happened? please, please, Louis. I'm not I'm not saying that I'm not putting fingers in anybody's chest. When I say we, we are all you know, we are all responsible. Not it's not it's not the administration, it's not leadership, it's not we all as a nation are responsible. Yeah, I understand. Um, whereabouts yeah. were you when when that withdrawal happened? What were your thoughts? Oh man, I was uh, I was finishing school, uh, probably sitting right here in my 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 little office right here, and uh, as you see, I don't have any. I I I I, I got some. I got some penis envy <laughs> watching all your other interviews. Everybody has all their shit in their office and everything. And, <laughs> and yeah, uh, they do. <laughs> look at mine. <laughs> and I felt bad because, you know, and no good, good on you guys. But like all my stuff I had up on my walls and everything was, everything was just, a uh, you know, some type of warrior reminder of Afghanistan or Iraq or a uh, unit that I led or some type of, you know, I always said a gift has got to be, you know, meet three criteria. You got to be able to drink it, drink from it or kill somebody with it. So there was booze or alcohol or mugs or weapons, you know, all up in my office. And I just, I couldn't even, I couldn't even stand to look at it anymore. And so I just took it all down, put it away. It's, it doesn't make it doesn't make you as an individual. It affects you as an individual because it's part of your up your upbringing in your life. And and out of the respect of the men and women I served with and and lost during that time, like I will always, you know, keep their hearts and um, keep their souls in my my mind and my memory. And I will continue to say their names so that we never forget. But man, it was just it it hurt like man, it hurt. I sobbed for days because I think about the good, you know, I think about when we rolled into Kabul and women and children were out playing in the streets and taking, you know, at the time taking burqas off, you know, there was no more rule of Taliban, you know, like you can't, you can't, you can't take that out of your head. You can't forget those memories. You can't forget about something great that you got to do for somebody else. And now it's just going to just roll right back roll right back into the chaos that they had again crazy it's incredible 
what were you guys told going out there for the first time? Like, what? I guess the question really is why? Why was the motive to go to Afghanistan and assist? Why was that so important? And what were you guys being told going out there that the the mission really was there? Well, that all the root of all evil had come from there. You know, all the terrorist training camps were there. Mula, you know. Uh, Bin Laden, you know, everybody, you know, Afghanistan was the the root of all evil and the CIA had been trying to fight them. Clinton in the day wouldn't give authorities for a close air support mission on Bin Laden, you know, even though the CIA had plenty of opportunities to take them out when they could have, but just never got the, never got the permissions. Um, good, bad, or indifferent, but that's what we were told. And then, you know, we were told that you know, this could take up to six months. We had to take over the country. We would use the Northern Alliance. Um, you know, they would they would want to fight with us. And once we did provide close air support, like once that once that promise was finally you know given, and this became a close air support war. You know, the Northern Alliance. I mean, in our final battle for for Bagram and Kabul, I had. I had Northern Alliance officers jumping on top of me, you know, when we were receiving fire, we were up on a building. I had Northern Alliance officers jumping on top of me to protect me because they knew if something happened to me, most likely that close air support goes away. Um, uh, I didn't have Scotty Zastro on that top of that building with me or Steve Gruel on top of that building with me. And those were the two guys on the team that were, most proficient in, in doing close air support along with JT Reed, but I just didn't have those guys there with me at that moment. So when the, when we started taking really bad enemy fire and we thought, all right, we're getting overrun. We're going to, this is going to be bad. Um, you know, so I had a lot of respect for those Northern Alliance fighters because they, they risked their lives just as we did. They wanted a better country for themselves, but Yeah. Could, but that's what we were told the mission was. And so yeah. we proceeded on with the mission and we, we fought like hell to, to end it in, you know, 25, 27 days, not mm -hmm. six months. Do you, um, do you think this could have been prevented? Would you have done anything different in hindsight with all of that? Just the things that happen now, was it, was it a simple, a simple solution to stop this from happening? Or was it always the case? It was always going to happen eventually with the way things were out there. Do you think? Yeah, Louis, I think you could what if it to death. I think our military, you know, our our leaders and you know, I I would I would I would like to say our politicians probably had the best uh interests, you know, of the Afghan people at heart, but they didn't. It came down, it comes down to money, you know. It comes down to money, defense contractors, you know, everybody wants to get their war on, everybody wants to get their kill on and um good on them. Um, but I think what the original plan um, and what what the conversations I was privy to was just keeping small uh, teams of special operations forces in country, working with Northern Alliance, keeping the keeping the Taliban at, you know, at bay a little bit, um, letting them kind of work through their let them work through their issues. And then if there was something going bad, then we could provide some type of you know, military strike or military support, um, but getting more involved with the humanitarian effort that was needed there uh, and just not trying to rebuild and restructure everything and put money in crooked politicians, you know, pockets over there. And, yeah. I don't know. Who, what do you who think, knows? Um, what could do you have, think is going to happen right now? Way. What do you think is going to happen now? Like you said, that place was the root of all evil and so many, so many horrors came out of there and it's back. Like, you know, it, it's back. So what do you think the future looks like in terms of the, you know, the potential effects of Afghanistan and the current state and current leadership? You know, how could that impact us over the next few years, do you think? It's, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna come back, you know, it, it's it's not if it's when there's going to be a there's going to be a major terrorist attack on our soil, you know. It's it's not if it's when, and it's going to be, 
you know, it's it's all related to the open borders. It's all related to the policies that we have as a nation. Now, there's going to be there's going to be a moment in time where um, the people training over there are going to be able to get a cell, you know, into America and they're going to do bad things to Americans and other people. And then everybody's going to go. Nobody was watching this. This wasn't on anybody's radar. And it's like, you know how you know how hard it is to to track and monitor all that stuff. And yeah. It's gonna happen. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna happen in the UK, it's gonna happen in France, it's gonna happen in the US, it's gonna happen where any sovereign nation celebrates freedom because that's what the enemy hates. They hate freedom, they hate the fact that we have freedoms and we celebrate them every day. And wherever there's a sovereign nation celebrating freedom of some type, man, those people are going to want to come and try to oppress it somehow or some way. Just running a quick ad break here, guys, for the sponsor of today's episode, AV8. AV8 is a fantastic watch brand that make aviation inspired watches. I've got a few of them. They send a few out. They are just amazing, great watches. And I've got a very special 20% off discount for anyone who's listening into the show today. So head over to av-8.com and use code LouisScoopian20 at checkout. And you're going to get a meaty 20% off any full priced watch. And obviously, man, you're going to have a great watch at the end of it, too. They're really, really good. And there's loads to choose from, all with their own bit of backstory and history and inspiration from pieces of history. So, yeah, head over to Aviate, guys. Use the code. And, yeah, back to the episode now. See you in a moment. What do we need to do to protect ourselves as the people listening in, the people you know, myself, just in general, what do we need to do? What do we need to consider? Vote. You need to vote. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I, you know, everybody can run the, everybody can run the doomsday scenario and, you know, get yourself a Liberty safe and stock up on, <laughs> stock <laughs> up on protecting yourself. But that's just, that's just, that's just, that's for fun. That's just, that's sporting clays back there. But, um, Man, just you got to keep your head on a swivel. You got to be educated. You know, you look at all these, um, you know, these protests at these college campuses. You know, the, these kids, they, they don't know. They don't even know why they're there. They don't even know what the river is. They don't know what the sea is. You know, 90% of them, they're just being paid by somebody to come stand out there and protest and possibly get arrested. Just keep your head on a swivel. Just be educated. Know what the you know, know what the policies are. I'm apolitical. I'm not, I'm not one way or the other. I just want the right person to say, hey, can we just get the right person? Can we just get the right person to lead us? I don't care what your political background is. Just, could you be the right person, be the right human to, to lead our nation and then get other nations behind us and, um, uh, you know, beside us and, Everybody just wants to. Everybody wants to make everything political about something and and the the rights of people. But man, I'll tell you what you you take some of these people that are protesting and you put them over in the environment for the people they're protesting for, they'll get murdered immediately. <laughs> they just yeah. they just don't understand that. But you can't you can't blame somebody for being uneducated. What are you gonna do? Yeah, of course not. I'm totally not asking for any kind of affiliation here or anything. But if you had to, no. if you had to put your your figure your your finger on a name potentially, who who do you think that good person might be, or is there actually is there a a good fit even anywhere in that in that spectrum of people running for it right now? Do you think run for a president? Yeah, just in terms of leadership. Oh man, is there is there anyone there who's <laughs> actually? you know who's actually deserves you who's actually worthy of it or are they all to some degree without pushing names but are they all just just cut from the same cloth basically just in a different form no i think man i you know um having been part of the having been part of the the trump administration you know i i think he did a i think he did a a, a good job i know he wasn't really well liked um you know we got uh 
me and some other fellow teammates got to meet him at John Chapman's Medal of Honor ceremony. And that's the you know first time I ever got to meet him. I thought he was a decent enough guy. Um, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a hundred percent for this administration. It's, it just seems like it's going all over the place. I thought Ron DeSantis, our Florida governor was gonna, you know, be the, you know, be the new, the new hope and, uh, lead us. But, um, you know, it's a popularity game, you know, he's done a great job with Florida. I know people, I know everybody has their opinion and, and I'm not, I'm not supporting one candidate more or, or not, but like I said, I just, I think the right person has got to win. Um, you know, if, if Trump wins, I know there's going to be, I know there's going to be chaos over that. And if Biden wins, there's going to be chaos over that. So what's the lesser of two evils, you know, really what's going to be the lesser of two evils, JFK, yeah. you know, to, to Kennedy and independent get to get to get to take it. I know that would make uh, I know that makes some people on social media really happy. Um, but man, it's just it's up in the air. Yeah, absolutely. Who knows? And, and as people say, you know, it, it's whatever the Russians want. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> it'll man. be uh, it's going to be interesting watching that all play out. Um, okay, moving on then from there so something actionable for the people listening in i like to tie in at least a few things people can take away from here and really apply into their own lives too so within that whole experience and career you've had within the whole you know both serving in the tactical and strategic levels of leadership really how would you say kind of your leadership style evolved over your 30-year career and what were some of those like really big lessons that you picked up along the way there that people listening in might also be able to kind of take a lesson from and apply into their lives um without maybe learning the hard way <laughs> yeah so there's i when i uh speak professionally or i'm talking to to people about leadership um it took me and and uh my, my last uh formal boss uh general dave Tabor, who i had when i uh retired and uh general chris ireland before him, you know, I really want kind of wanted to like look at okay, leadership. You know, there's 21 aspects, 14 aspects. You know, there's all these books on leadership that everybody everybody reads and just regurgitates and everything. But like, really, what is the what is the what's the nuts and bolts? I mean, you know, what's the what's the meat and gravy of leadership? And it, it's humility. You know, it's it's being, um, you know uh you know for 30 years out there busting my ass breaking my back you know still trying to keep up with the the young guys and gals out on the you know pt field or the battlefield it was it was always doing you know the right thing for them you know leaders eat last you know watching other leaders and how selfish they were you know at an event or you know so quick to critique or you know, um, judge something and then, you know, hold themselves, uh, uh, you know, kind of like above the law. And then they're, they're fucking doing the same thing, you know, behind everybody's back. So it was just, it's basically humility. And I came up with, um, five words that, you know, what I, what I kind of, you know, when I talk to people about leadership and it's, you know, I'm like, Hey, just, just write it down. It's just a note. It's not, it's not anything that's going to make you a better leader, but it, when when you're come up on a tough subject or something, and you're thinking about something or how do I handle a situation, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be able to give you a talk you all the way through it, but maybe some of these will help. But, you know, being that I was a combat controller, I came up with CCT, our, our acronym is CCT and then me. And so it's just commitment, creativity and trust. You know, those those three words, you know, into any leadership thing or any teamwork thing you're going into are you committed to it you know like I look to my left to my right you know and especially in what I'm doing now as a as a retired person if these people aren't committed with me then fucking get rid of them you know like I'm, I'm sorry even if it is volunteer or whatnot it's a committee are you committed if you're not fucking committed then fucking take a hike I don't need you you know that's the first thing if somebody's not committed to something boom you're you're never gonna you're never gonna you're never gonna sway them. You're never gonna get them to to want to do anything. 
creativity. Can they think outside that box? And then trust. Do you trust them? I know so many people that work in businesses and they're like, man, I just don't trust that person. I just don't trust that person. I'm like, well, then why do you work with them? Confront them. Tell them about it. Bury the hatchet and move on. Or one of you leave, you know? I, I just don't trust that person. Like, how many times have you heard that? Like, I don't trust that person. Like, you know, then fucking get rid of them or or you go to something else. And then the two, the two final things is um, me, maturity and expertise. Do you think, Louis, because I'm older than you, that I'm more mature than you? Or do you think when you walk into a room, if you're the oldest person in the room, do you think you're more mature than everybody else in there? No. Any leader, any follower who thinks that, then they're sadly mistaken and they're wrong and they'll never be able to get a cohesive team if they always think they're the most mature in the, the room. My wife reminds me all the time, I'm 12 years old and I love that. I want to have that 12 year old heart. I want to, sometimes I'm eight. Some This weekend, like some of the I, ideas I had about hanging out at the pool with the dogs, they were like, she's like, what are you, eight years old? I'm like, hey, all right, we're going to have this competition. We're going to throw the ball. If you can get it on the towel shelf, you get five point, you know, like, what are you, eight? No, I'm young at heart, man. You know, like, do you have that creativity and or maturity, you know? But when it comes to work, you got to be mature and then you got to be the expert, man. You want to be able to rely on people. Are you that, are you that go-to person? Are you the person that is an expert in this field or an expert in this subject that, you're going to, you're going to be called upon. You're going to be asked upon to, to, to do it. Um, I've been, um, I've been working professionally in nonprofits now for eight years, raising money. Um, I was told because I wasn't a former officer. I didn't have an MBA. I didn't have an MPA. I didn't have a certificate and nonprofit work and this and that, that, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to raise money and I don't know how to do this. And I could never be in charge of an organization. Well, I'm the fucking chairman of an organization now and we're doing just fine. And it's Thank because you. maturity, expertise, commitment, creativity, and trust. And I surround myself with those right people and man, we're doing good and we're doing good for our veterans and we're doing good for service members. Let's go into that. Hold Anybody back. tells you you can't do something? Oh man, get get angry, get get furious, get that fucking warrior in you, and come back at them and go, yeah. oh, not only can I do it, I'm gonna do it a hundred times better. I love it. It's a great mindset. <laughs> so let's talk about a POVAT then. 2019 to assist veterans with legal, medical, and disability issues. What inspired the initiative, and what has been the impact so far? Would you say? Well, like I said, I got to retire as a command chief master sergeant, you know, um, retired, uh, my disability, my compensation and pension rating for the VA was fine. 18 months later, went in for a checkup. And uh, as we all do, most of us all do in the military, we always say, we're good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Because nobody cares. Nobody wants to hear about it. You know, you're passing somebody down the street. Hey, how you doing? And they actually stop and tell you, you're like, that was rhetorical. I didn't, I didn't really mean it. I didn't care. You know, that's kind of how we are in the military. And that's how we kind of are as veterans. When somebody goes, Hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm good. You will get somebody to tell you all their problems. Um, uh, but that's usually the person that, you know, was the, uh, the, the, the sick call zombie, you know, they were always at sick call. There's always something wrong with them. No matter what you do, you're never going to make them better. Not that there's anything wrong with that because the world needs people like that. But for about 99% of the veterans out there, there's people that, man, they just, they know that nobody's going to do anything unless they do it. So they just say they're good and uh, went into the VA that day and said I was good. And the VA literally took it literal. Uh, they reduced my VA down to my cop and pen down to 30%, which then uh, enraged a uh, three-year battle with them. And uh, I figured if they could do this to me, then they're probably doing it to a lot of other people. And so uh, when we won our, our case, the first thing we didn't do was celebrate. The first thing we did was uh, me and the two other co-founders, we started Project OVAT, one vet at a time. And we wanted to find those vets that went through the same scenario like I did. 
Uh, we wanted to find those vets that didn't have the proper compensation and pension rating. We wanted to find those vets that um, maybe by no fault of their own just didn't get the right rating. Mm. And we wanted to find them and we wanted to help them and we wanted to help them at no cost to them. There are entities out there that don't charge the veteran. Um, great, great organizations that help our veterans, but I kind of believe you get what you pay for. And then there's entities out there that take money from our veterans. And I get it. People need to put food on their table for their families. Um, but I don't think it should be at the cost of our veterans. And so we started a nonprofit. And we get donations. And then we pay medical consultants, psychological consultants, and legal consultants and case managers to work those cases professionally, um, precisely, uh, and with great expertise and maturity and commitment and creativity and trust and we get them to work those cases and we get our veterans to the proper VA compensation and pension rating that they have earned and deserve and so so far we've got 200 plus uh veterans through into our project we got 150 plus veterans cases solved all with uh, positive results um, and then on average, through our forensic uh, financial analysis, our veterans are receiving over a half a million dollars in benefits back over their lifetime. So it's a great organization. Uh, we got, I volunteer for it. My team volunteers for it, Amy and Lyle Rosine. And then, we, like I said, we pay the experts to get the work done. This is what we owe back to our uh, community as senior NCOs, as senior enlisted leaders to volunteer to do this and make sure that their cases are taken care of, their cases are heard. We're going into four and a half years later of having appeal cases heard in front of a federal judge. Povat was there for them in the beginning and we're there for them now. One of the one of the best initiatives I think I've heard in a really long time. That's absolutely phenomenal. How do you how do you fund that? How does, is it all through donations? How, how do you support that? Yep. All through donations. Like I said, we just, last weekend, we had our big charity fundraiser up in uh, Sussex, Wisconsin. We had a big golf event. We have some corporate partnerships and then we have just some great patriots out there that want to see our veterans taken care of. Um, we, uh, like I said, I volunteer. I don't receive any type of compensation for it. Um, my program director and my operations director, they volunteer as well. And then that way we can ensure that our case manager, our medical consultants, our legal consultants, um, you know, the money goes to making sure those cases are, are taken care of a hundred percent with, with a hundred percent expertise. And then we get the veterans, the, the compensation and pension rating they've, they've earned and deserve. It's and again, it's all done through donations. That's amazing. Who does who does this apply to? So if someone's just listening in right now and they're they're kind of thinking, wow, this is great. Don't know if it applies to me though. Who is this for? And what what are the initial steps into into getting that grant then for someone? So we are we're a referral agency. So in order to get into our program, you gotta be referred by one of our like the way we looked at it as um like kind of like I was veteran zero and i knew another veteran that needed our help so we helped that veteran and then that veteran knew another veteran so we helped that veteran so it's it's complete referral off of our veterans we put through the program um the only thing they owe us well two things they owe us they owe us a testimonial if they would like to give us one and then the second thing they owe us and they have to give us is the name of another veteran that they know is hurting and they got to introduce that veteran to us. And it's kind of like a big brother, big sister program that they're there to help mentor them. So when things get a little tough or, you know, we're, we're asking them for records or uh, asking them to talk to the psych doc about something, you know, they're going to be there to help support. Um, and then obviously we get recommendations um, from our from our board members. We get referrals from our board members and other team members. And then through our corporate sponsorships, um, our corporate sponsorships are allowed to, to, to give referrals. We've never said no to anybody. Um, we, we don't have people applying off the streets. It's got to be some type of some type of referral, but we'll always we'll always find a way to yes. We'll use that creativity 
and that expertise to find the way to yes and help somebody that is reaching out for help. Yeah, I'm aware. I'm aware of some foundations that are quite specific with who they target. Like I think one of the foundations I won't use the name, but I think they only um, they only provide grants and healing grants for like gold star members, gold star family members, mm-hmm. and so Povat. That's anyone as long as they've been referred. Yep, we will we will help any service. Um, uh, space, space Force is still pretty young, so we don't we haven't had any Space Force. Uh, uh, clients yet, but, uh, <laughs> we'll help any service, uh, we'll help any, any, you know, any gender, any job, uh, you know, we're not, you know, at first we were like, oh, oh this is just going to be reserved for special operations type people. No, um, I worked at an organization that did that and you exclude so many type of people, uh, that have done great things. Everybody's got a story compensation and pension or disability isn't a comparison. It's what that person experienced. And so we treat every client as it's not a, you know, we, that's the first thing we do. We tell them, they're like, Oh, well, I wasn't in combat or I didn't do this or I didn't do that. And it's like, Nope, don't worry about it. It's, this is yours. This is your compensation and pension. This is what the military and your service, what happened to you, not compared to what happened to anybody else. And so, yeah, we will help anybody um that gets referred to us it's, it's amazing right okay well let's wrap it up here let's go into the shameless plug thing because i'm sure this ties in quite nicely to it so you know take <laughs> take that minute take those few seconds to direct people to where we can go donate support and if you have any you know websites or anything for your speaking engagements too where we can take a look at some of that stuff or find out more about you just yeah shameless plug away send the people listening in to where <laughs> we can uh, get some cool stuff well, I appreciate it. Well, and I'm wearing the Povat shirt uh, made by one of our board members, uh, Brian Dwight. But uh, yep, projectovat.org. Uh, uh, you can go to our website. You can donate right through there. We uh, we use uh, one of the, the fundraising tools, uh, Donor Perfect, right off of there. Um, we're also on uh, Venmo, um, but you can see us on any of the social media platforms, um, Facebook, uh, X, and LinkedIn and uh instagram uh is out there but uh again we just uh you can go to those sites you can read any of our testimonials from any of our clients um and we're just doing good things for uh good people amazing stuff well thank you so much for joining me today for the podcast it's been an absolute pleasure having you on and honestly i just want to just want to shake your hand one day the work you're doing is incredible and just so much so much admiration for you it's just fantastic so well done you it's it's very honorable it really is well, i appreciate it i really appreciate the time and uh yeah this you've had some i i'm honored to be on here you've had some fucking incredible incredible people on here to try to live up to and so i'm just truly honored to be on here and thank you for what you're doing and getting the awareness out there absolutely well it's my job and it's an absolute absolute pleasure to be able to talk to people like you but yeah guys thank you for listening this was episode 113 if you'd like to listen to the past episodes go and have a look at the channel like i said there's some amazing ones a great place to go from here would be the one with cz it's a great talk really is um so yeah go listen to the uh the past ones go subscribe for the future ones and make sure to just spread some love leave a like leave a comment and yeah guys have a great rest of your day Fights on. See you in the next episode.